Hero, everyone. So, to the moon, Alice. To the moon. Welcome to Thursday Night Connect. Uh, grateful to have you guys. Uh, reason for this title, uh, we'll get to in a moment, but uh, hopefully some of you out there in uh, Facebook land or watching later would remember uh, the Honeymooners. I, uh, it was pretty well, like, it was in rerun mode anyway as I was a kid, but I still got forced to watch it because of Jackie Gleason, and uh, so hopefully you guys got a kick out of the title. Anyway, you'll have to do your own research on it. This is topics surrounding marriage and making it work, but more than that, I want to talk about um, more specifically what we will be addressing tonight. If you've never tuned in to Connect before, it is our opportunity to stream live uh, answering questions regarding topics. So we, we will cover everything in Connect from uh, questions that people have about end times, eschatology, the rapture, to um, you know how to raise kids better. We'll talk about um, money matters and how to better plan for financially. Then we'll tackle on he heavy duty topics like, um, is it okay to be gay? And a Christian as well. They, you know, all these, everything that the, the, the culture has surfaced, we want to address and connect. So we, we plan it out. As If you get on our website, you'll notice that that will be off for two weeks because of Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, same with New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Um, but after the first of the year, we'll begin to make new ones. I've been planning out several, been working on getting uh, different speakers, so that'll be all announced very quickly. Um, we have one planned right now at the beginning of January. And then we have several others that will be launched pretty quickly. So you can go to highlandheightscc.com, which is our website, and click on the Connect tab at the top left, and it'll t show you all the different topics coming up. So if there's one that you're interested in or one that you, you, know, you would like to, to see us do, you can always email us at, at uh, connect at highlandheightscc.com. And you can actually do that tonight as well for your questions regarding the topic. But I don't want to just talk about uh, marriage. I want to talk tonight about a few things. I want to address uh, some stuff if you're single. I want to address you if you've been divorced, even divorced multiple times. I really want to talk to those of you who are thinking about getting married. And like I said, again, if you're single. Um, basically, I want to address us individually. And I want to talk to you um, about how we need to really pattern ourselves and understanding who we are, first of all, in light with God. Because um, even if you don't have much of a faith um, or, or you're working on trying to understand who God is, you really need to establish that to be able to then understand why we make biblical references to marriage and to being single and what all of this means. So if you're joining us live tonight, um, there's a microphone there. You'll just need to go up to it, make sure it's on before you ask your question at the given time. Uh, also, if you're online, um, we'll, we'll pause here in a, sh a short bit, but if you think of something, you can either email, which is anonymous, or you can comment in the Facebook link under the comments. Please use the comment section um, going forward to, um, to be able to uh, ask questions, so we'll, we'll answer them at the appropriate time. All right, but before we get started on this, I'm going to say a little prayer, then we'll get busy. All right, Lord God, thanks for bringing us all together. Thank you for the questions that will come in tonight. I pray, Lord, that I can help everybody answer, answer the questions of which they have. Um, a lot of times we don't know what to ask or who to ask or how to ask it without feeling embarrassed or, or maybe slighted or cheated, but that's not what we're doing here tonight, Lord. We're trying to answer them biblically, and we just pray that you'd provide us an opportunity to do so. In your precious name we pray, amen. All right, God designed marriage as a lifelong commitment between one woman and one man for their mutual joy. All right, the good of society and the procreation of children. That, biblically, is why marriage was formed. Marriage ultimately displays the glory of the grace of God by picturing the unbreakable relationship between Christ and the church. All right, At the heart of mature masculinity is the sense of benevolent responsibility to lead, provide for, and protect women in ways appropriate to a man's deferring relationship. Uh, at the heart um, uh, of mature femininity is, is freeing disposition to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership 
from worthy men in ways appropriate to women's differing relationships. Now, the reason why I'm setting this up for you is that every one of us, as we're listening to just this little bit of a monologue here, are going to think, man, I've, I've been married, it didn't work out, uh, marriage sucks, marriage isn't, isn't for me, why do you just need a piece of paper? Just These are questions you're going to probably have. Not going to scold you if they are your questions. We want to address that. That's why we're doing this. But I got to give you a foundational background, backdrop as to why, what's going on here, and then we can move forward, okay? Now, biologically and scientifically, there are only two identities based on chromosomes, okay? Um, and there was a, an article that came out this summer. It was a published report of science giant um, nature.com. And we have learned that there is no, I repeat, there is no gay gene. Um, there is only attraction, as we know, as believers. There is only sin and temptation, as we know it from the Scripture. Regardless, this is big, because we know that there are men and women. Uh, do women sometimes feel like they're a man? Men feel like they're women? That's not tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is working through the marriage challenge, okay? But, but better understand traditional marriage. The ultimate thing to see in the Bible about marriage is that it exists for God's glory. Uh, most foundationally, marriage is the doing of, uh, is the putting together by God. So ultimately, marriage is the display of God. It's designed for God to display His glory in a way that no other event or institution does. Okay, now the way to see this most clearly, in con to connect it, is Genesis two twenty four with its use in Ephesians five thirty one through thirty two. I'm going to go to that. Okay, because so the mystery of marriage revealed in the in the book of Genesis chapter two verses twenty four, the words "hold fast to his wife" and the words "they shall become one flesh" point to something far deeper than we actually understand it, or maybe we've even experienced it. Um, maybe with our parents, my parents divorced at the age of four. Um, we all see people divorce. We're all products of divorce, maybe from our parents. Maybe we're products of divorce in our own marriage. Um, but this is why we need to understand these words point to marriage as a sacred covenant, and it's rooted in covenant commitments that stand against every storm as long as we both shall live, or as long as they both shall last, okay? But that statement becomes explicit when the mystery of marriage is more fully revealed. So here we go. Ephesians 5, 31, 32, it says this. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So now, in Genesis 2, 24, God says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What kind of relationship is this? What kind of relationship is this? How are these people, how are these two people held together? Can they walk away from this relationship? Can they go from spouse to spouse? Is the relationship rooted in romance, um, sexual desire, the need for companionship? Um, how about cultural convenience, right? What is this? What holds it together? I mean, I, 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 I think we all have questions regarding it. So this is what we're getting to, Okay. But the ultimate thing we can say about marriage is that it exists for God's glory, according to Scripture. Now, the rest of the world, and you'll hear other people, other, other um, profound, smart people that, you know, make tons of money, and they're, they're marriage experts, and they don't hold to the, the biblical account, the biblical record, the biblical mandate, so they're going to have their reasoning why marriage should work, what it's for, the institution. Hey, feel free all day long to listen to them, but you're tuning to Connect and I'm going to answer you biblically because I stand on the biblical principle of it, not what the world says about it, okay? I'm a defender and an upholder of the Word of God, not the culture. So what I'm going to answer you is going to be from the cultural standpoint, okay? Um, marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant relationship to his redeemed people. And who are those? The church, right? Therefore, the highest meaning and the most ultimate purpose of marriage is to put the covenant relationship of Christ and his church on display. This is why marriage exists. 
This is why it was actually made. Um, it was made to procreate, and it was made to show what God had put together. What God has put together, let no man put asunder, right? If you are married, that is why you are married. Uh, if, you, if you hope to be, that should be your dream, as to you're going to be the emulation of what Christ wanted in us people. Now, we are told that the church is the bride of Christ, so when he returns, it will be to join with his church, okay? Just like a wife cleaves to her husband, there is an ultimate painting for us to understand the depth of marriage. Christ will never leave his wife. He promised us that we, his church, is his bride. So he's never going to leave us, which means when he, he comes to consummate the kingdom come, okay, we think of consummation from a sexual standpoint. When he comes to consummate, it is to, it is to rid the world of all of its evil. It's to bring the, the, the believers in him to him and to recreate or rebuild or make a new world we know as the new heaven and new earth, and it is to live forever with him in his radiant glory and to, to just live in his glory and get to share as heirs with him. That's what ultimately, that's the ultimate marriage, and that's the ultimate wedding feast. It's, it's something that we don't always understand because we never think about marriage being that way. You know, a lot of young people I, I meet with now, they go to get married, we always want to sit down and do a premarital counseling. And a lot of them have a very, very different view of what marriage means. They have an, a, a concept, and usually it's a, it's a social construct of what they think marriage is. Well, I don't, you know, one kid said the, one of the best lines ever, um, best line tongue-in-cheek, he goes, well, I don't want to leave her. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, we're going to start with that. I, I didn't, you know, when I'm meeting with people, I, I, I don't like to um, uh, diminish what, they're, what they feel like is important. But the most important implication in the conclusion that keeps cut is that keeping the covenant with our spouses is important as telling the truth about God's covenant in Christ Jesus, all right? Now, we clearly are going to address questions that folks have tonight regarding divorce and the guilt associated with divorce, doing our best to stay married even when it doesn't seem to make sense for some, and, and being single, okay? These are all of our, our, our topics tonight. And all the other questions in between. So they're, they're, these are gloves off, you guys. If you have questions surrounding any one of these things, we're going to address each one of them, and so we will address it. Maybe something we'll talk about here in five minutes will make you think about asking a question that you just heard. No problem. We'll go back to your question. We'll answer it the best we can, and we will answer it biblically. So here we go. I'm going to tackle divorce next, all right? But I, I want you to have the, the chance of asking questions that you might have so if you email us right away, we, can, we will get your email, and uh, Gage can ask your question of me with no problem. Connect, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, at highlandheightscc.com. Connect at highlandheightscc.com. Or you can ask your question in the comment section. All right. Again, if you ask it online, it'll be anonymous, and we'll keep your anonymity as long as your question is in um, good taste. You'll need to get your questions posted as soon as possible. All right, divorce. A lot of people are worried about they've been divorced. How many people know somebody who's been divorced? Like everybody, every hand went up, right? Every hand went up. We all know people who've been divorced. A lot, a lot of people who are listening tonight have been divorced. And I, and I think you're going to be, I, just, I want you to hear all of this. Not going to get on to you for being divorced. I think there's been, there was a question that I'm going to surface here in a second, and it's a legit question that you might be able to identify with. We want to help you understand that it, it's going to be okay. You hear me on that? First and foremost, it's going to be okay. Let's, let's address this, all right? I want to get right to the question that this was emailed in. It says, I was in an abusive marriage and a lot of cheating. I got out of the marriage alive, and I am now divorced. He called asking for forgiveness, forgiveness, which I truly forgave him. Is there scripture in the Bible for getting a divorce and with it being good with God? That's a legit question, and I want to send an applause to that person for asking it because that takes a lot of gumption, a lot of courage to ask it. First of all, I'm sorry you were in an abusive relationship. Nobody should ever be in an abusive relationship. And it, you know, a lot of times you hear abusive relationship and you think, what? Physical abuse. But there's a lot of sexual abuse in marriages. 
which is really hard to believe, but there, it actually does happen. Um, uh, counseling is part of a pastor's forte, so I've, I've heard a lot of stuff. So there's sexual abuse, there's physical abuse, and then there's two horrible ones. One is emotional abuse, um, beating a person down, being condescending, being rude, making fun of them, making them feel uh, inferior. And the other one is, and that's kind of a, you know, that's obviously a mental abuse, but that actually affects, affects us emotionally. So I'm going to kind of link in that regard, emotional and, and, and mental in that regard, because they really are one and the same, although there's a big playing field. Feel me on that one? And the other one is spiritual abuse. I think when you neglect your, your you know, if, if somebody is married to another person who's a believer or, or inquiring about God, wants to read the Bible, and the other person chastises them, makes fun of them, oh, there's no God, you know, what are you, a religious freak like your mother? You know, these kind of comments come out of people's mouths. These are the, these are the things that we're seeing in, in culture, and we've seen it for hundreds of years, thousands of years. This isn't new. But that's abusive relationship, and that's a sad thing that you had to go through. Um, I'm glad you forgave him, and I'm glad he asked you to, to forgive him. And uh, I want to share with you a scripture here. Um, to the married, I get, this is, come. sorry, I'm going to give you the, the biblical reference. Most of tonight, by the way, I will share the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, okay? At one point or another, every verse of 1 Corinthians 7 will work its way into my answers tonight because it is a perfect chapter to reference. Verse 10 and 11, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, Paul says, not I, but the Lord, the wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, if you cannot, if you cannot reconcile that marriage, okay, I want you to hang on here because there's going to be more coming, but I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going to fly forward yet. Hang on with me. What did Jesus say about divorce? And I say to you, Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual morality and marries another commits adultery, okay? So sexual morality is the only constitutional ground, the only, the only grounds for divorce according to Scripture. So if you got a divorce and there was an adultery in the marriage, you are free from the bond of that marriage. Yes, of course, there are instances where there was an affair of some sort, or even multiple, and the people worked it out and stayed married. That is one of the beautiful stories you hear of people working through their marriage that even, even when it's been broken like that. Now, this is not an exception to the rule. Um, and this is a glorious praise to God when this happens, okay? But most of the time, this does not happen, at which case the couple divorces after an affair. Got it? Now, what we do know about one of the main overarching themes of the Word of God, one of the overarching themes of the Word of God in the New Testament, what is it? It starts with the word F, the letter F. What is it? It's all, the whole New Testament is founded on this, not faith, not faith. It is forgiveness. Okay? Why do I bring that up? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is divorce unrighteous? Yes. Can he cleanse you from it? Yep. Matthew 6, 14, 15. But if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of yours. Big one there. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. A couple more. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 3.19. Mark 11.25, again, New Testament. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, also who's in heaven, may forgive you of your trespasses. And finally, Colossians 3.13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. You guys... The entire New Testament is built on the foundation of forgiveness. This doesn't give you a right to get in the proverbial sin mobile and just 
right down the road, right? You just you can't take off the highway of sin and indulge yourself wherever you want. You've got to realize that you've got to be you're held you're being held accountable by the scripture. You are to hold yourself accountable. As a born again believer, you are to continue to work as part of your sanctification, the ever changing so on and so forth of you as the person, right? We're climbing the steps. We're not not the steps of accomplishment. We're walking through life and knowing that we're changing all the time. Forgiveness after loving God with all of yourselves. That ultimately is what this is. Forgiveness after loving, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the uh, second is equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the foundation of how you are to love and move forward. So forgiveness seems to be the Lord's model. Amen? This is like so many other things that it doesn't seem to give us free reign, you know, to do whatever we want in and, and, and regard to sin. This is what we must practice. But it does give us an understanding of how to work through our troubles, and then God can help us repair them, or he removes us from situations, for instance. So this is why I love affair with Jesus Christ is the most important thing. That's your, st- that's your starting point. That's where you begin life, is to fall in love with Jesus Christ. It's got to be your first love. And then the sin will, will you know, um, it's easy to know people who are still doing bad decision making around us. It doesn't mean that they're, that, you know, we cast them off. It means that we love on them. And sometimes you got to bring a friend in and go, you know, I, I'm, I'm troubled with you doing this. You've been doing this for a while. Um, I love you, man, and I don't want to see you do it anymore. That's the loving rebuke of which we got to have. This is, this, is, this is Christianity 101. You know, I can't believe you sinned. Get out of my house. Right? That's not what he wants. He wants us to go, come here, come here. I love you. You're wrong. You're wrong. And, and, and you get, right? Help him out, though. And do it in confidence. Do it in confidence. Do it in, in loving manner, man. This is, this is what God wants of us. All right. We're going to advance now to listen to 12. Listen to 12. Verse 12 through uh, 17. To say, excuse me, to the rest I say, I not I, not I, not the Lord. So he went first from saying the Lord, not I. He says I. And any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, you should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Have you ever read that before? Have you ever read that before? You should. You should. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. Got it? Okay. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Who put that in my Bible? But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Or how do we know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do we know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Mic drop Paul. He's showing you, you gotta, have, you gotta have a standard. You may not be able to follow it. And we may have, you know, we may have walked into this, this little lesson tonight, you know, carrying the baggage and the memory of several divorces. Does that make, you know, you know you're, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. You, Satan wants you to stay in your shame, you guys. The best place for Satan to keep you is in your shame. Because then you can look at it and you're like, man, I, I don't know why. I think about this all the time. I am, you know, I, I am working through this. So you're working through this. This is Paul's encouragement. If your unbelieving spouse leaves you, you have to let them go. Yes, of course, you'll try to get them to stay. Who doesn't want to try to get a marriage to work, especially when they're the ones going, yeah, I'm out, I'm done, I, I can't do this anymore. But you can't make anybody do anything. You can only work on you and the children, that, if you have any, that you're responsible for. Well, this segues into the next point, staying married, okay? So we got a few more points here to get to this evening. This is, normally I do 10 minutes and we field questions. 
So we will answer questions, but I think we just need to address all these points, then we'll give about 20 minutes, okay? So staying married, therefore, it's not, it's not about staying in love. Hear me out on this one. It's about keeping a covenant. Till death do us part, or as long as we both shall live. They are sacred covenant promise. The same kind, the same kind that Jesus made with his bride when he died for her. So when he died for us, he knew that it was going to be till death do us part. But then he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he will come back to join with his church. This is important that we remember this. So Christ will never leave his wife ever. There may be times of painful distance, uh, tragic backsliding on our part, but Christ keeps his covenant with us forever. Okay? Salvation is not for the choosing. Salvation is something you were given as a gift from God because you repented and believed and you received him as your savior. Marriage is the display of this. That is the ultimate thing we want to do. So if you're in a marriage and you're kind of going through some rocky times and you're really not sure if you want to make it work or not, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to appeal to you by Scripture, Ephesians 5.33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 1 Peter 3.7. Likewise, husbands, live with your, with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. How many people have a bad, a bad uh, uh, visual memory understanding of marriage? How many had it at one point? We had, come on, more people out there than not had a bad, we think of it as, we think of it as a judgment. Well, she can't stay with him. He's a jerk, right? That's you hear stuff like that. Or oh, I don't know, man. You shouldn't be with that woman. I told you she was bad news. Okay. Hang on a minute before you just go taking the trash out. Okay, is that really a trash object? We got to pray through this. Hebrews thirteen four. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Be kind to one another, says Ephesians 4.32, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And then finally, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So it's, it's a man's duty to love God with all he's got. And if he does that, then he can love the woman the way she's supposed to be loved. And if a woman loves God with all, sh- all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength, she'll be the best woman she can for the man. It, 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 you know, we, we, we view this as, well, the marriage, the, the marriage temple that God put together, the covenant marriage, has failed. Well, yeah, it failed. When we kicked God out of everything, it began to fail. You know, you want to remove God from um, every access, every public access you can. Look, the schools are teaching uh, Jewish tradition. Well, in public school, I I know, because I've got a kid in public school, and he's uh, talking about they're teaching Jewish tradition, so they're saying, like, Happy Hanukkah and stuff. Okay, cool. How about, is Merry Christmas included in there? No. Of course it's not, because, you know, we're going to recognize everybody in anything, but we can't recognize Christ? See, we've removed him from everything. They're like, well, Judaism is God. Don't, Don't start. You already know. I got the blood in the, I can explain that to you if you like, but I don't think I got to. The point is, Judaism works into Christianity because Christ is the Messiah of the Israelites, <laughs> right? Of the Jewish people. He's rejected if you are still practicing Judaism. It means you don't practice Christ as your Savior. Sex in the marriage. This is a big one that I want to I want to put onto another topic night because I think what we need to do is tackle issues inside relationships. But if you want to know what the Bible says about it, you need to go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. Okay? Now, concerning matters about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual morality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the husband to her wife, excuse me, the wife to her husband and then the the husband to the wife. 
The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and then you come back together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Boy, that's a tough one for marriages. Two problems with marriages today. Arguments on money, arguments on sex. Read the Word of God. All right, if you're getting married or engaged, I'm Christian and my, wa- my husband-to-be uh, is Catholic. Here's a question that came in for us. How do we make it work with two different beliefs? That's a great question. Great question. Also, thinking of the future with having kids and raising them, Christian or Catholic, is there scripture to support this question? So I'm going to read this to you. Do you know what betrothed means? It means to be engaged. Okay? You'll see that when you hear in the Christmas story um, that, that Joseph was betrothed to be mar- to, married to Mary. Right? That means engaged to be married or together. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the betrothed, engaged, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. You have to use discernment on this one. For your question, per the question itself, generally, the Catholic factor needs to, needs, leads me to ask this. Um, is they, are they a cradle Catholic? See, cradle Catholicism, in other words, they were raised because it was part of their family tradition, but they aren't really a practicing. Practicing Catholic and cradle Catholic are really two completely separate things. Cradle Catholic might go to Mass on Christmas time. They don't ever go other than that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to marry somebody who's outside of your religious understanding, your, your following, you need to go to a Christian counselor or a counselor altogether to talk about these things. What happens if the kid's born, you have a kid later, and the kid's born, and uh, unbeknownst to you, the spouse-to-be now, later on, says, oh, yeah. Got to send them to. Uh, Got to send them to this school, this private school. Well, hold on, what do they teach? And then you look at it and you're like, yeah, I don't agree with this. That's nothing but friction waiting to happen in a marriage. How about what you celebrate at Christmas? Do you go to midnight service or do you go to Christmas Eve service at seven? I like the seven o'clock one. I kind of like the Protestant way. Just saying, it was the first thing that appealed to me when I walked out of the Catholic Church. That's Kind of funny, stupid funny there, but um, you need to have this, this talk with your spouse-to-be. It's important. All right. Being single. We turn yet again, 1 Corinthians 7. So this next passage I read to you was horribly perverted by uh, uh, the, the, this is why priests don't marry. And this is why we've had a severe problem with priests and nuns alike having severe problems with um, sexual immorality, especially that with children. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. In verse 6, goes to 7. I wish that all were like, uh, like as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. He says at the beginning, I wish all of you could stay single, but for the sake of temptation and, and, and the burning desire, if you can't, then you got to get married. See, there are a lot of single people in the world. There's a lot of single people in this church. Probably there's a lot of single people online. And you probably want to know, like, all right, well, I don't know if I'm comfortable here. I am, but I'm, uh, and I've been married before. I thought about it before, but right now I'm single and I'm loving it. i got to answer to no one. I don't have to pick up the towel off the floor after it's been wet. You know, the fork in the sink is okay till tomorrow. You guys, you guys got it better than you really think. So, and to the, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that this is good for them to remain single as I am. Verse 9, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Move down to 26, verse 26. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. 
But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal in the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of the world is passing away. Here's the point. Paul is exercising an opportunity to say this. You can enjoy life, but this isn't it. This is not the end. When you die here, there is another thing that happens, um, and it's death, right? Death, and where do you go? Well, you either are apart from God or you're with God, and this is what he's referring to, and it's, it is, you know, he's just reminding you that your, your joy, your treasure's not here. You know how many people spend $25,000, $30,000 on a wedding? For what? No, thanks, man. I... I, I just don't understand that. I don't think there's any there's any reason for that. Well, the, I hope the wet bar was good, you know? Um, but Paul says that he wants us to be free from anxiety. So we're going to open up for your questions now. If anybody is, uh, has got questions regarding marriage, now's the time to ask. So uh, where are you at with questions? Guys, okay. Gage, you got any? All right. Anybody in here got a question? All right, cool. Somebody's working their way up to the microphone. All right. All right, world, don't leave me hanging here. Come on. All right, nobody's got a question about marriage, being single. As soon as we're done tonight, man, I should have asked that question. Oh, I was thinking about it earlier. All right, we'll give everybody a second here. You know, one thing I want to share with you is this. Um, in verse 36, it says, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his, his uh, to be married, his, his engaged, his betrothed, if his passions are strong as it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let, him, let them marry. It is no sin. You, you see the establishment of this is important. We do have a couple questions. Is there a microphone on? Tap it. Oh, it's just muted. Hit. <laughs> Carly, thank you. That's hilarious. Carly said you're going to get tons of questions later tonight. Yeah, probably so. All right. TJ. Okay. Um. Is it bad to want to be married even though you're single? No. No, I think what Paul's talking about, you know, remember this. Paul is, Paul is setting up churches. He's trying to church plant. He's trying to get people to do the same thing. And so he's really, when he's writing these letters, he's really trying to get the, you know, the fellas, you know, to go, all right, do what I'm doing. You know, let's, let's go. Let's go set up churches but if you can't abstain from that and you got to settle down and be married, then you do that. So his letter had an intention and a purpose, but it's also understanding that we, we, can, we can put that together and go, okay, no, no, if it's a desire to be married, I think everybody wants to have that other person in their life. Sometimes you find it without being married and you just have a really cool, um, you know, sexual free relationship. Um, you have friends that you you know that you're just close with. Uh, we all have that in some regard in life. It's it's a, it, sometimes that's just as strong or just as important. I, I don't know why I always thought it was cool. Dead Man Walking, the movie. Susan Sarandon is a is a is a nun, and she's talking about that. And he says, and the, the guy on death row says, "What do you mean? You don't you don't? Why did you become a nun? You don't want to ever have sex?" And she goes, "Well, I suppose so, but I think intimacy is just a, a you know a wonderful conversation of." of holding hands with a friend and talking or, you know, cuddling up over a, a cup of coffee. There's no sexual uh, tension there. And I always thought that was really kind of a neat way to look in at life, and, and I don't think we do. I don't think we, we always have to link it to something sexual, and it doesn't need to be. 
All right, what other questions do we have? Thank you. Lori, I'm not even answering that question, so. <laughs> so people, single people can't have sex without getting married. So sex before marriage is a sin. It just is. If you're having sex, then it's a sin. God does forgive sin, but I think if you're drawing nearer to God, it's not going to be as appealing to you as it once was when you were in the flesh. You know what I mean? So really the struggle, yeah, so that, there's your answer. You got your answer to your question, but the struggle is real. All right, Gage, what do you got? All right. Uh, do you believe there's... <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. That was crazy. Uh, do you believe there's someone for everyone or that there are supposed to be single people to balance out humanity? I think there needs to be single people to balance out humanity. Um because we find that that happens. Now, um, at the same time, I think we have a, a world that, you know, we live in an interesting time where you have like, I've, I've had four marriages that I've officiated where they met, met on Match.com. I never will forget the first one. I'm like, how'd you guys meet? And they're like, Match.com. I was like, really? Dude, that's kind of cool. And then sure enough, there was three more. Um, so there are, are, are sites where people have met and they, are, you know, they, they find another believer and they're able to and join together and cool. But, but as far as, I don't know. I don't know that there's somebody for everybody. I mean, there's a lot of people who died lifelong single and they're very happy their whole time. So I think Paul wouldn't be encouraging it if it wasn't going to happen, right? All right. What else do you have? All right. I'm going to... I'm going to guess what these say. So uh, what is the church's view on plural marriages like uh, polygamy? Yeah. Um, so when we get done, I'm going home to watch Sister Wives. So that's my thing. I'm just kidding. So uh, <laughs> anybody watch Sister Wives? That, come on. Come on. It's not funny, but it is. All right. No, it's... Uh, Polygamy is not, um, uh, is not accepted by the Word of God. Um, it's very clear that the Word tells us one woman, one man. Um, you know, when you see these, um, I think they're Mormon, right? And they kind of rewrote the rules because the founder made up his own rule. He made up his own rule about how God came to him, and nobody saw that. So uh, he was like, uh, God said I can have lots of wives. Woohoo! You know, they, he made up his own rules. So when we follow the actual word of God, one woman, one man, that's it. Okay? Who else? So, nothing? Why do I, why do I, how do I keep from beating my husband and, you know, hey? How do I get her to understand that the game's on? I'll do the, do the chores when it's over. Because your game begins at noon, and when Sunday night football's over, it's about 11 o'clock. That's why she's got a problem. A couple half times in there. You know. Okay. All right. Uh, so what is the church's view on gay marriage? What is the... Church's view on gay marriage? Yeah, I don't... That's word for words. I don't know if it's ours or... Okay. But anyway, yeah. Well, let's go, let's go to biblical view, first of all. Because I can muddle the waters by saying the, church, the church's view. Because the church as a whole is filled with believers everywhere, but there are a lot of churches who are appealing to the culture going against what the Word says. The Word of God says that there is no gay marriage. So we stand, and in, in, the, in the church that we are in, um, do we love anybody who walks in the doors who's gay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we love them because we, we love Jesus Christ and we know that the Lord is changing us. He can do the same to anybody. That's up to God. We plant the seeds, right? We sow the seeds, we water them, God grows them. 
That's not up to us. But the church's view, wide open. Methodist churches, a lot of times, there's been a lot of different denominations that are okay with gay marriage. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> Randall, the Raiders are on. He's got to go. I understand, dude. Go for it. Um, but seriously, the, uh, uh, the, but the biblical view of this is not up for debate. It's, it's not. And it's, it's tough to, you know, it's not tough to answer the question. I have no problem answering the question. It's just trying to like, no matter how I answer that question, there's going to be somebody who's like, why do you hate on the gays? I'm sorry, did I miss the conversation? I just said if they walked in, we were going to love on them. We just, you know what I mean? So there's always that, in that risk of that. But biblically, it's not accepted. It's one man, one wife, boom, done. Either single or married to one of them. That's it. What else you got? All right, I got one on. So the spiritual roles in a marriage and how to make sure uh, that one person's not crossing over the boundaries of each role. Okay. Can you can you be, do your best to explain that? I uh, think I get it. I but. think, you know, the man's role in a marriage and then a woman's role in a marriage. And okay. And making sure. All right. Well, um, I think what happens a lot of times is in the culture we begin to think that there's somehow a model. Like, we jokingly call this to the moon, Alice, and if you ever watched the Honeymooners, you remember that um, Gleason worked all day long and he got home to his tender wife who was a, a homemaker, right? A lot of things are different in our culture now. Um, there are pictures of, on Facebook of me, because whenever I'm in the kitchen, I have my Switzerland apron on, because I'm not going to get grease all over my shirt, because when I cook, I get very messy, because I chop and dice and mince everything, and I like to work with butters and olive oils, and so I'm always making a mess. That's my gig when I'm in the kitchen. Um, so people see that, and they're like, oh, hey, that's me. That's what I like to do. Um, my father taught me. His father taught him. Okay, so does that mean a guy can't be in the kitchen cooking? Uh, come on, you know, I mean, that's where we have to start kind of like, that's where the culture would maybe make fun of that in certain ways, and then we'll roll reversal, like, what about the woman being a breadwinner? Well, the Word of God tells us that the man needs to not have idle hands, and a lot of guys these days do. I know more guys that spend more time on the video game machine than, than they do working, well, if they're working, it's cool. But if they're not working, it's not cool. Get to work. Go do something. Do something, you know? And it's going to help you. You know what? Most time, the guys that I talk to that haven't been employed for a while are having problems are the ones who aren't looking for a job. There's a lot of guys who are looking, honestly, for honest work. But they don't have a job yet. But the ones who are just not doing it, I think I'll take a, you know, sometimes people can't because they've been laid off. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who are directly lazy and claiming a reason why they're, they're not working. We got to have the discussion about, well, what, what's wrong with you here? You know, does the Bible tell you that idle hands is a devil's workshop, right? Basically, we've heard that one before. Well, the Bible's, Bible tells us that idle hands does this. It creates a man who's, go to the book of Proverbs. So guys should be working, gals should be working. You guys figure out your roles, but you're still a guy and you're still a gal. As long as that doesn't change, you're okay. Next question. Oh, hey, um, somebody had a comment. Mindy, singleness is a gift, but don't forget Christ used marriage as a metaphor for relationship with him. Now, and that's actually, Mindy, I'm glad you said that because I actually opened up with that metaphor about how Christ is going to come back to consummate the, the eternity with his bride, which is the church. Very good. Well said. Thank you. Got another one there, Gage? Yep. So, uh, is it okay for me to support my gay friend in his marriage, even when the church does not? I think you need to support a human being because you're, you're an emulation of Christ and you've got to love that person. Um, it's, it, that's a difficult question. And sometimes we're put in difficult situations and you need to use the, the spirit of discernment to tell you what to do. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a, there's a, 
most of the time in a situation like that, I've, I've heard both people, I'd say, you know, I can't, I can't go to the marriage because I can't support that, and I, and I understand that. Another person says, well, I'm going to go because I'm the only one that Christ emulates in their life, and I want them to know that I still love them. And I'm, you know what I mean? So look, if we start withdrawing from the entire world because of the sins of the world, pretty soon you're going to find yourself in a very lonely world. Our job is to love on them. That is God's to sit now. Now, they come to you and they go, what do you, how do you feel about me being in a relationship with six women? You know, then you can go, dude, this is stupid. You're not supposed to be doing this and it's not good for you. By the way, how are you pulling that off? Because, you, do you, you know what I mean? Like, how do you actually like mentally pull that off? Because I know they're blowing up your phone. Why aren't you talking? Why aren't you talking? Why aren't you talking? You know, and how are you pulling that out? Six sets of flowers? But seriously, you know, you, you want to be the encouragement to the person, especially if you're the only light in the very dark world. So you got to use your discernment in an area like that, okay? I could go on a whole. No, you're good, Mindy. I'm glad you asked the question. So if anybody didn't catch the beginning of it, you can go back and watch the beginning where we understand by explaining the institution of marriage. Um, no, I don't have a way of reading the emails as I get them. So uh, Gage is moderating any emails that he gets, and he throws them at me as they come in. So do we have more? Yeah. How many more? I got one on the email that I, I just... Okay. We got a question live, then we'll go to that email, and we'll end up tonight. When you talked about role reversal in marriage, the man is supposed to be the spiritual leader of the marriage. Yeah, correct? thank you, Bev. And I did not state that. Um, that's the goofy part of connect is that you kind of get all over the place. The man is the spiritual leader. Um, as I tell men all the time is that you, you are the pastor of the home. You are the pastor of your home. You lead by example. You lead by emulation. You lead by, by studying with them. It's up to you to show your kids like having a family worship time of maybe getting together and praying and reading the scripture together. Um, it's up to you to lead the, the prayer at the table. You know, a lot of guys will run in, grab their plate, run back in the living room, pop on and watch the game or something. Okay, that's fine, but why don't you pray with your family first? So the, the man is the spiritual role model. He is that. And I'll tell you what, the woman's role is just as important. And we've talked about this before in other connects and in services, that the woman's role for a man, the man can't pull this off without her, and she can't do it without him. So if you want a godly marriage to work, it's got to be godly from individuals first and then together. Okay. All right. Uh, it says that they're 33 and their husband just passed away three weeks ago tomorrow. Uh, mm, they want to know... Uh, what the Bible says as far as being a widow and moving forward? Good question. So, okay, um, for the, uh, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that. That is, um, that is, that is difficult. Um, I am a widower once in my life, and, and uh, a very good friend of mine the other night lost his wife uh, a few nights ago. And uh, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever gone through in my life. So um, I, my heart goes out to you, and... We are honestly praying for you, and if, uh, Gage, you have a name, I would like the name after Connect is over so we can pray for that person. Um, one thing I want to, I was going back here a little bit to my, I'm going to tell you, we were quoting earlier, and if you didn't tune in in time enough to catch all of it, we were, we were reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, because it covers so much. So if you go back and read 1 Corinthians 7, it actually addresses um, the widow. And other thing I want to tell you is if you go online and um, go into topicalbible.info, topicalbible.info is a great resource. You can go um, into your Google search bar and top, topicalbible.info and then pull up a page and there's a, there's a place where you type in something. And you type in something you're looking for. So like if you put widow, it'll give you every reference that the, the computer can generate that has the word widow in it. And you can go there and pull up scripture. And then, and I would do this. Don't just read what they give you because they will only give you a little snippet. They don't give you a long passage. Write down, like if it sticks out to you, go, okay, 2 Corinthians 4, all right? 
then go and read all of 2 Corinthians 4, and you'll find where that, the context of that portion of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth will be able to reflect upon what you're asking about and give you a better bridge. Okay? Topicalbible.info, yes. Uh, I think the website's openbible.info, and then the... Is it? Yeah. Why does it always show me topical? That's like the title of the thing. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Open Bible. Open, yeah, openbible.info. Don't listen to me. Listen to Gage. He's the one that I'll, does I'll all share. the computer stuff. All right. Um, Miss Dana had a question. Did you see that one? Uh, yeah. Okay. So what about marriages where the man is relatively non-spiritual? Dana, God bless you for asking that question. And I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, you, if, you are, if you are in love with the Lord and you are in a marriage where, like if you have a newfound love of God, um, you begin to have a faith walk and your spouse doesn't, your spouse is actually, um, God will show you what's going to happen there. I, I can't tell you what's going to happen but God will protect your husband, or if you're the husband and your wife doesn't go and doesn't really care about it, you're, you're, the Lord will protect her. Um, but either way, that's something that you know uh, you got to pray through and work through. But focus on you. Uh, be respectful and loving in your marriage, because your 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 spouse could very well come to uh, faith in Christ and receive Jesus as their Savior because of your witness. Um, there's a movie that came out about. Um, uh, a news reporter, remember this? Um, the guy that set out to do the story, write the book, why God wasn't didn't exist. Case for Christ, Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel. Um, his wife prayed for him for two years. The scripture, Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, which is God break break their heart of stone and give to them a heart of flesh. So like when we pray for somebody that just has a, a hatred towards God, you can ask for God to break the heart of that person and soften them up so that the, the, the love of God can come into them uh, and, and be shown to them. And that's, that's a, it was a really beautiful movie and a great scripture. So, Okay, I think, is that all right? All right. Hey, you guys, thank you for watching tonight for Connect. Uh, we were going to be out for two weeks. We will... Click back on and, and uh, check out our website, highlandheightscc.com. In the next couple of days, we will upload all of what we're going to be doing in the month of January, February. Uh, we will continue to weekly stream our, um, our, Wednesday, our Thursday night services, our Thursday Connect, a lot of different topics. We are always open for questions, topical discussions, whatever you want. And uh, I'm working on some different hosts who will get up here and, and talk for 10 minutes and get a little speech about a topic, and then I can facilitate your questions to them. Uh, so we're working on that all the time. So we're grateful that you tune in tonight. Lord bless you guys. And, and I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the word that you've given to us. Thank you for the 1 Corinthians 7, which we can refer to often uh, to understand your, you, you know, your guidance on us. Lord, we've all made mistakes in our life, and we're all currently making mistakes or, or working through them, or we'll be faced with bad decisions or tough decisions in the, in the future. Please help us to understand and discern through that because we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Please help us guide through that. Thank you to everyone who is here tonight and online. We give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And Bev, thank you for the spiritual leader part. I needed that. Thank you, sister. That is something I wasn't thinking of. So Lord bless you guys. Have a wonderful one.